Solar and storage costs have fallen so much over the past few years that they are now the lowest form of electricity generation in many regions. Electric vehicle charging is a logical application for solar plus storage, according to Sage McLaughlin of REC Solar. Her company offers energy as a service, which means REC provides the capital to buy, install, and operate the equipment, then offers a fixed rate to the customer as part of a 20 or 25 year power purchase agreement. The customer saves money, meets sustainability goals, and receives other benefits like a shaded car park in sunny climates like California. She spoke to Energy Media from North Carolina. Welcome to the interview, Sage. Thank you. Now we're gonna be talking about solar and storage as an integral part of EV charging infrastructure, but what kind of EV charging are we talking about? Are we talking about the uh, chargers that you see in a parking lot? Are we talking about, you know, maybe um, larger depots where you charge up school buses and, and uh, you know, delivery vans, that kind of thing? What, what are we talking about? Uh, we can talk about any and everything. I'm a big fan of EVs, uh, but more specifically, we typically, when we're talking about solar and storage and their impact, we're talking about fleets and municipalities, manufacturing. Um, we typically work with a lot of cities, schools, hospitals. So yes, to an extent, uh, we're talking about parking lots, but I think in general, we're talking about folks who have large fleets who can make a big impact with emission reductions. How much demand is there for that? Like, I understand that fleets are getting uh, are more common, and that's a big draw on the on the infrastructure on the uh, on the grid. Uh, and I imagine uh, you're located in California, where I, I've talked, I've interviewed other folks who are kind of in this space, and they, you know, like in San Diego, San Diego, you might get you know fifty cents a kilowatt hour at uh, at peak times. Is that a, a big driver of, of why, uh, you know, let's say uh, a business would go to, you know, your uh, kind of charging uh, project? Yeah, uh, it varies for folks. I think a lot of folks are seeing it from a sustainability standpoint. They want to bring down their emissions either for their own operations or because they are a vendor of somebody who has some pretty solid scope one, two and three goals. Um, in California, we see a great amount of it just because they have net zero goals and they're trying to reduce their emissions. Um, specifically, when we're talking about solar and storage, in that case, you can get um, financing that locks in your energy rate. And then when you're applying that with EV chargers, it just helps kind of figure out what the next 20 year of, of costs might be. Um, and so I think it's it's financial, um, but it's also very sustainable, uh, sustainability driven as well as being driven by folks um, and, and their vendors and their customers. Now, your company has a, you know, energy as uh, a service model. Maybe you could describe that. Yeah, so REC Solar focuses on um, solar and storage solutions. And so we partner up with folks who are doing EV infrastructure quite a bit. Um, what we do is we come in and design, own, operate, and manage all of the solar and storage needs. So you don't have to become an expert on all of all things energy. We know it's really hard to transition a fleet. You're moving from uh, fuel cards to <laughs> kilowatt hours. And so being able to have one more thing that you have to think about just complicates the ecosystem. So we come in and we can do on-site storage and, um, and um, solar that helps kind of ease that up. And that's how we provide uh, energy as, as kind of a solution to the EV position. I, I I think that that model has got to catch on in a big way because if I'm a business and the, the one thing I don't want it to do, um, unless it's really a compelling business case, is to put out the capital and all the, you know, manage a project, that kind of thing. But you own your company owns the the infrastructure. You bring the capital. You 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 own it. You operate it, and you maximize the revenue from it. And and so I get lower costs. Uh, I don't have to spend. I don't have to invest anything. And I've got experts who can you know maintain it and repair it if necessary. I mean that that business model just makes way too much sense. I love that. Yes, uh, I should just bring you around with me in my pocket to tell okay. everybody this. It it makes a ton of sense. Um, and really, the folks that we work with, um, be it 
food manufacturing or cities, hospital, universities, different municipalities, they're not folks who um, might have access to capital at the drop of a hat. Um, and so it's really easy to have the conversation of, would you like to bring your energy costs down? Would you like to have fixed energy costs? The barriers to success that we kind of hit upon um, are, do you have the land or the rooftop or uh, the parking lot to put solar? And that's that's one of the, the kind of reasons that folks might not do this right away um, is because it, it takes space to do it. And we know space can be limited, but um, we're typically pretty creative with how we solve for that. What about the cost of solar panels and battery storage? Now, we've seen them come down a great deal over the last 10 or 15 years, but generally we think about those as, you know, they're from China. And China has got the lowest pr uh, prices for that kind of equipment. What are you, are you buying your equipment from China or is it made in the U.S.? We get equipment from a number of different places. Um, they, while China manufactures as well as the U.S., uh, there's also a number of other countries that do as well. So um, we look to build solutions that make the most sense for the customer. So we um, we first and foremost take into consideration safety. We want to make sure uh, the the modules we're using and the batteries that we're using are safe. Um, and then safety often uh, allows us to find, you know, the financing and, and work on the financing side of it. So um, we procure from many different places. And I think we're in a lucky spot because uh, as things get, as technology gets more advanced, it gets more affordable, more people start producing it. And so we go for low cost, but we go for safety first. Well, but let, I want to stick with the cost for a bit because uh, the, uh, the cost curves for both storage and for solar panels are still dropping. And even especially in the US, they're, they're they're continuing to drop. Yet the prices for electricity that you buy, you know, if you're wired into the grid, are going up as a rule. And that just makes your business model more and more attractive. So what kind of how much are we talking about for per watt for a solar panel and um, a per kilowatt hour of storage? Uh, it varies depending um, on where it's located, what type of modules we're using, whether they're fixed or tilt access. Um, there's so many variables in there, but we really do design specific to the customer's need and what the customer's usage is. So um, not everybody wants to start with battery. Battery can be the more expensive side of the story to start with. Um, but these are these are modular systems. You can can build them out. So you can start with the the solar and then add battery later on, and then even further later on, turn it into microgrids. Um, but every, the price on every project is different. Not to sound very consultanty, but it depends right. um, on where they're located. Um, you know, the trees there, the uh, whether you're doing rooftop is a different price than it would be for a ground mount. Um, carports obviously are a different price as well. Um, but what we're seeing, especially with some of the EV charging options, is not only can you get solar from those um, carports, but then people really like shaded parking. And <laughs> when you're starting to talk about some of these areas where you want to be able to offer um, EV charging, the ability to offer shaded parking is extremely appealing. And, and we know that folks can charge higher for shaded parking spots than they can for sun exposed parking spots. And then when you're talking about solar um, as an asset on property, people associate solar with safety from a security uh, alignment. So again, there's opportunities while you will have to pay different prices for different type of um, setups for your solar canopies or, or, or ground mounts. Uh, you can also find revenue streams in there to help offset it. Yeah, most of our uh, audience is Canadian they, and they won't appreciate just how important shaded parking is. But I worked for five, uh, three years down in Bakersfield. And, you know, where it gets to literally 50 C in the summertime. And if you left your car out, uh, you know, for an hour while you went into a meeting and it wasn't shaded, good Lord, it was like opening an oven. Uh, yeah. you, you had a, you'd have to open the car door, wait for a little bit for all that hot air to get out. And before you could, it was safe to sit down in your car. I mean, th so this is a, a situation you don't find in Canada very often, but it's a big deal down where uh, in California. Um, what kind of, how much per kilowatt hour 
uh, would a system like, you know, are we talking in the 10 cents kilowatt hour, 20 cents kilowatt hour? And is it generally under the, you know, what I could maybe buy a, a electricity from from a utility? That varies. Um, I think, uh, you know, again, depending on which utility or, um, yeah, which utility you're with, where you're located, um, we focus a lot on uh, the United States. And so we know that energy prices in a regulated territory will be very different than an unregulated territory. Um, I would say whether you're thinking about um, how prices vary versus the utility, one thing that we do is we can um, establish a fixed cost or a fixed escalation uh, rate over time. And let's say you do a 20 year power purchase agreement. We can do that with a, let's say a 2% escalator every year where your utility does not know what their escalation uh, point is. And so they might be two or 3%, but they could be 12% uh, if they have to do different assets for um, you know, storm mediation, we could be talking 12%. So I think um, whether, while it depends on how much you're paying for a solar system versus the utility, what we can do is we can lock in a rate, which I don't think utilities are doing these days. <laughs> Is the, the and I, we should talk a little bit more about these power purchase agreements because that's a really key, a really key part of your, your business model. Um, so let's say that we, you know, somebody went into a 20 or 25 year PPA with, with your company. Uh, I, I want to still nail you down a little bit on what, how much per kilowatt hour it might be, even if you can just give us a range. And is it under what the utility is going to be charging? I would say um, we, well, I can't, can't promise you a specific number or specific range. What I can say is we typically see cost savings versus the utility in year one. Um, and so we look at uh, what's your current usage, what you could get from peak shaving. Um, so leveraging your solar or your battery during those peak hours when utility rates are more expensive. And if we can save you money in the first year or the first five years, man, we definitely consider that a win. You will see savings over the life or the term of the power purchase agreement. If you don't see savings, um, the conversation can end there. You can say, hey, it doesn't it doesn't pencil right now. We don't want to do it. Um, or you can say, you know, how much growth do we need? What does it need to look like in order for us to see savings? Our goal isn't that we go out there and we blanket the whole world with solar and, uh, you know, just change the, the landscape. Our goal is that we're uh, reducing emissions, that folks are using renewable energy, and that it, it's sustainable from not just an environmental standpoint, from, but from a business standpoint as well. Um, I'm kind of curious about arb arbitrage. Uh, so if... Um... Your system that you've designed, like, okay, I buy a system and you now have access to, you're running it and operating the, the system and uh, cheap solar is getting stored in the, in the battery. You Are you feeding it back into the grid at the right? I guess you said you are because you, you said that you are taking advantage of when prices are high for the utility. Is that an important part of the business model that being able to arbitrage different rates? It can be. Um, again, it depends on who your utility is and where you're located. Um, California had some beautiful net metering policies where they could really make money by um, sending their, their excess energy back to the grid. You're starting to see that die off in different areas and get adopted in new areas. So um, there's times where that's that seals the deal and makes solar pencil really, really well. There's other times where just based off of your operations, or if we're talking EV uh, charging, your fleet operations, where it doesn't have to go back to the grid, you're just offsetting your costs, um, and, and you're just um, leveraging your own power when you need it. What about seasonality? Um, I mean, I know California is sunny all, all the time, uh, <laughs> or most of the time. But does that, I mean, I, I get that all the time up in Canada. But, you know, folks say, well, it doesn't always, the sun always does, the sun doesn't always shine. The wind doesn't always blow. What do you do in those cases? I assume then that the, the business is hooked up to the grid and, and that's used as kind of a backup. Yeah. Oh, well, and, and the grid is primary. Um, I think we, when you're talking about solar and storage, these are beautiful resources that bring wonderful um, cost savings, wonderful energy, renewable energy to the situation. 
the grid has the infrastructure. The grid is the grid is uh, you know established, and so um, seasonality definitely takes into consideration uh, how much power you will get. So yeah, you are not going to get solar power in the middle of the night. You are not going to get solar power if you live in a forest under a lot of trees. We all take that into consideration prior to ever putting up the system. Um, southern facing uh, solar farms do much better than other farms. Um, and so we we look at the land, we look at how much, um, you know, how many mountains there are, how many trees there are and all of that. And we take that into the, the bigger picture when we're determining how much uh, solar will be produced and what does cost savings look like. Now, sometimes that makes an even better case for energy storage because you say, hey, we don't get the sun all the time, but we can store our power and we can leverage it when it, when the sun's not shining. I'm, I'm kind of curious about this. I've done a number of interviews with uh, folks who are <clears throat> analysts and they're talking about uh, the impact of perovskite uh, panels that are coming. And for folks who aren't aware, the perovskite's, a, I think it's a crystal. And you when you add it to the silicone uh, structure of a, a solar panel, you increase the efficiency from like 20, 22% to high 20s, maybe even low 30s. Does that make a difference for a business like yours where you, the, you're, the panels that you're going to buy maybe a little more expensive, but they're so much more efficient? Technology always makes a huge impact on, on what we're doing. Um, again, we start with safety. Uh, safety, rel safe, reliable, affordable energy is the premise on which I think most energy is uh, working towards. Uh, we have had the opportunity to use really innovative technology. Um, we worked on a, on a project for uh, Google where we got to use dragon scale solar. Uh, and so it had a really unique look uh, down in Southern California. And for their headquarters, they wanted concaved uh, dragon scale um, uh, solar panels to have a specific look and um, but still to get the renewable power that they needed. And so um, one of the neat things about energy, and I'll say I was I was reluctant to move into the energy industry originally. I come from a family of uh, engineers in, in nuclear, and I thought, oh, energy is so boring. Uh, it is so innovative. It is so neat. And so we're always following the technologies and um, the different efficiencies that they bring, the different safety attributes that they have. Um, and, and I think that's one of the things we'll continue to see grow, whether it's um, different operations and facilities becoming more energy efficient or different generation and storage technologies becoming even uh, even safer, even more um, uh, applicable. I have to ask, what in the world is Dragon Scale? <laughs> Dragon Scale. So Dragon Scale uh, was a specific, uh, a specific solar uh, panel company came up with Dragon Scale Solar, uh, and it's concaved. So when you think of solar modules, you think of typically flat um, at an angle. Uh, if you look at the Google headquarters, which we feature in a, a coloring book that we released, um, they do have concaved uh, solar panels that when you line up together, it looks like the back of a dragon. Um, and these are cool ones that uh, actually come in different colors. And so uh, for Google, it was really important to not only have the renewable energy and, and then they have some beautiful sustainability goals, but it was also to have their headquarters have a specific look of, of innovation and technology. Um, and so, yeah, dragon scale solar. Very interesting. Well, look, Sage, thank you very much for this uh, and uh, good luck with the business model going forward. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.